I'm going to hop right in and introduce our very next speaker for you. This guy is old school internet. I read his bio and I was pretty much blown away. Uh, Chris Lima from the United States. He's and played the, the Incontinent Encyclopedia again he, he knows all about the Incontinent Encyclopedia and the CD-ROM drive. Uh, he's been working on websites and applications since 1994. That's before you were born, Nick, wasn't it? Yeah. Yes. Um, he spent time at Berkeley Lab and has been a part of no fewer than five startups, which is pretty amazing. Um, his current job is at Emphasis Software. Uh, he develops B2B hosted solutions for specific vertical markets. Um, and he also coaches WordPress startups in his spare time. And I, for one, am super excited to hear what he's got to say here for us today at WordCamp. So, Chris, welcome. Guys, put your hands together for Chris. <laughs> have over for dinner. Not the kind that you just meet at the restaurant, of course that's where it started. We would go out and meet, my wife and I would go out and have dinner at a restaurant with her and her husband and, and we did that a couple times but we got to the point where it made sense to invite her over to the house and so she came to the house and we're not talking about just the, you know, the kind of people that come over every week or a couple weeks but, but more like the every month kind of meal but enough, close enough that that we would invite her over before the meal starts. You know, the kind of people that sit with you in the kitchen and, and they get there a couple hours early and they help you prepare the meal. Those kinds of friends. And we were there hanging out, cutting food on the island in the kitchen, hanging out, when she looked at me and she said, I was talking to some folks and it sounds like you can help my dream come true. Now, I don't remember exactly what I said I did when I introduced myself to her the first time, but it was probably... It was probably something like, I build enterprise software. Enterprise. Enterprise software. For vertical markets. In niche vertical markets. Do we get it there now? Enterprise software for niche vertical markets where we're sticky and can sit in the essential parts of the organization. And, and that was just a lot of words. Niche vertical markets enterprise software. That was basically code for saying, no, I can't help fix your printer. <laughs> but this time, we're sitting there getting ready to cook dinner. And she looks at me and she's like, I hear that you can help make my dream come true. I did what any rational, intelligent human being would do. I said, well, can you first tell me your dream? She had this vision of, of building a company, her own company, and of course I'd worked in several startups, I'd coached several startups, and so I said, well, tell me more. And it was to build a, a company that was part bookstore, part cafe, and part massage therapy. Now don't judge, it wasn't my dream, it was hers. <laughs> but I said, well, why don't we start with the one that's most important to you, because it sounds like you actually have three businesses there. And she said, well, I really, I, I'm all about the massage therapy thing. That's, that's the stuff that I would do forever for free. It's my passion, I want to do that. And I said, yeah, I, I can help you. In those days, I was the kind of guy who said, you know, I'm a one-stop shop. In fact, I would say things to other people like, my clients like that I can do everything. I can design the logo, and I can design the site, I can do the design, I can do the coding. Uh, you know, I can, I can work on the content. If I ever say that to any of you, just walk up behind me with a two-by-four and just hit me on the back of the head. I'm done with those days. But in those days, I was a one-stop shop. And so I said, yeah, I can help you. And so there we were working on her logo, and it was maybe the fourth iteration, and I say four because if I told you seven, you'd think I was a little crazy. And if I said seven, it'd be because I'd be lying, because I didn't want to tell you 14. But there we were, and she still didn't see the logo that wanted to pop. And so we were working it through, and we finally got to the logo she liked, and we went to the, to the site itself and designed the theme and got the site set up. And then I started working on content because, you know, she was busy. 
And because I was a one-stop shop, and so I wrote all the content. I know so much about deep tissue massage. I know all sorts of kinds of massage, and it was all set up in the site. It was beautiful, and she loved it, and she was ready to have her dream take off. And then she said, well, how much do I owe you? Well, you've been there. You've heard the question. And I did what you've done. I looked across and I said, well, you know, I, I love doing this. I love helping people. Why don't you tell me what you think it's worth? <laughs> and so she paid me 2,000 rand. When she first said $200, is in like the four of us go out to dinner and have a bottle of wine and we spend that $200? That $200? Or maybe we were talking about a different currency in a different country. Maybe $200 where she was thinking of meant a lot more money, but no. She was talking about $200. And I'm like, I both did the logo and the design and the theme and the coding and the content for $200? If you think that's bad, I want to tell you another story. My wife and I were at that point just engaged and we found a florist and the florist was fantastic and we loved all her stuff and so we asked her to do the flowers for our wedding and I, I did what I normally did in those days. I said, what's your email so I can send you some information about our wedding? And she said, I don't have an email. I said, you run a company and you don't have an email? Well, do you have a contact form on your website? She said, I don't have a website. I said, okay, well, you know, I have a day job, but in my spare time, I help people like you, and I could probably help you get a website up and even get an email configured. And, and she said, oh, God, that would be glorious. If you could do that, I would give you a discount on your flowers. I will hook you up. Okay. I know so much about flowers. <laughs> Design the site, design, the, you know, got it all set up. Didn't have to do the logo, that was good news. But she had 80 photos she wanted to put on her website. And some of them didn't look good, they weren't cropped, the lighting was wrong. And I opened up Photoshop and I digitally altered 80 pictures in a row because I was a one-stop shop. I was the guy to make it look perfect. And she would tell all her friends. So we got the site up, it got launched. But the email had to go somewhere, and it turned out she didn't have any software for email. So I went to her office, and I installed Office and Outlook on three different computers and set up their network because that wasn't configured, and got it all configured and all set up. And then I took my beautiful bride-to-be to the appointment where we picked out all our flowers, and it was ready. And then she said, okay, now the price is $1,100 for the flowers. $1,100, $1,100. She said, but I'm going to hook you up. <laughs> Sweet, free flowers. So let's just round it down to an even thousand. <laughs> <laughs> You're taking $100 off my bill? Why don't I just kill you? <laughs> I tell you these stories because I want you to understand that if I'm going to talk to you at all about losing profits and anything about professionalism, you need to understand that I'm not coming to you from an academic place. I'm coming to you from the very place where you've been, maybe where you're still at. I've been at those places where I've worked forever and got paid barely anything, and I've learned the hard, the long, hard way, the long, hard, stupid way, how to get better and how to be different and how to interact and manage my interactions with customers. But before I go longer, I know we just had lunch. I know that you're tired and probably zoned out. So let's just do a little interactivity. How many of you have ever been to the dentist? Raise your hand. Awesome. I ask it that way because if I asked it the other way, how many of you have never been to a dentist? You'd be a little more bashful raising your hand, wouldn't you? 
So you've been to a dentist. So let me ask you this question. When you go to the dentist, have you ever had this experience where you go in, you sit down, the dentist walks in, and you sit down and you say, okay, so I have a hole right here in my mouth and I think I need an implant, but I would like you to use a titanium screw when you screw it into my skull. Anyone done that? No, none of you have given advice to the dentist. Okay, well, how many of you have been to a mechanic for your car? Awesome, okay. And so when something's wrong with your car, I'm not gonna ask this question because there's always one jerk in the audience that likes to raise his hand. But you could imagine <laughs> that when we drop our car off to the mechanic and they're the professional, that we don't drop the car off and say, the timing is wrong over here and I'd like you to adjust this. We don't do that, right? Because they're the professional. How do you design sites for clients? Right. How many of you have ever listened to a client tell you that they need a slider on their homepage? <laughs> yeah? No, I'll just wait till the rest of you decide to stop lying. Because <laughs> I know it's there, right? You're the professional. You're the professional, and yet someone walks into your office or someone gets on a Skype call with you, and they tell you that they need a slider on their homepage. And you say, well, the customer's always right. I don't tell the dentist how to do his job. I don't tell the mechanic how to do his job. And I certainly don't let clients tell me how to do my job. Does that make sense? By the way, sliders suck. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever driven on the freeway, but as you're driving on the freeway and you're seeing those billboards, do you even have billboards? I haven't driven on the freeways enough to know, but you probably have advertisements as you're driving down the road and those advertisements are going back. They're going right by you. I mean, you're going, you know, 120 kilometers an hour, driving down the road, and you see one ad, and then you see another, and then you see another. And have any of you ever stopped and said, as I'm driving, let me pull out my phone and dial that number that I just saw go right by? <laughs> no. No. I've gone to websites where the slide is there, and I'm like, that's awesome. That's a great. Let me go click on the. Oh, shoot. There it goes. <laughs> I'm like, oh, look at this event. This sounds really good. Let me click on the more info. Oh, shoot. There it goes. <laughs> like, this is maddening. I'm sure there are certain situations where a slider makes sense, but having someone come and sit in front of me at the beginning of a project and tell me I need a slider on my homepage, well, we're going to have a conversation. <laughs> yeah. In fact, and you, and you have to do this carefully and you don't want to be rude, but I often will sit with someone and I'll do it gently and carefully, but I'll ask them, I need to understand a bit of your background. I mean, like, do you have a PhD in, in, in psychology? that I don't know about, or have you written white papers or patents on decision making, or decision science, or do you know something about, have you written or published an article about shopping cart abandonment? I ask these things because if you're an expert in this space, by all means, as we start making these decisions, I need your input. And they look at me and they're like, no, I don't, I don't do any of that. I, I run a flower shop. <laughs> oh, okay, that's good, that's good. Because at some point in our interaction, there's gonna come a moment where you start giving me your opinion as if you did have the credential. <laughs> and I just wanna get it straight now that, that I'm gonna be the professional on this side of the project and you're the client. If you do it carefully, you level set expectations and roles. I've never tried to tell my dentist how to do his job, ever. But I guarantee you if I did, I guarantee you if I told the dentist, I, I like titanium for that screw, the dentist would then spend the next half hour educating me on, on the pros and cons related to that. And more often than not, we don't get involved in the education of our clients. We just go straight to, okay, well, I'll just, the client's right, I'll just do what you want. And in fact, we let ourselves get to the place sometimes, don't we? Where we'll do something that we know is horrifically wrong, but you know, they're paying the bill. You don't want to do that. It means that in that moment, you have ceded a part of your professionality. That you've been less than totally professional. And it's one of the ways that we lose profits. Because what happens when you're in that cycle of being not professional enough, what happens is our clients override us and they start dictating another iteration, another iteration. Now, get, don't get me wrong. I'm totally fine for scope management. I'm totally fine for scope creep with additional dollars. I'm totally fine with having intelligent conversations. 
But when we're just trapped in this, I'll just do whatever the client says. Because they're paying. Even though I know it's wrong. Even though I'll head over to the bar afterward and talk crap about them later. You don't do this, but there's audiences in the U.S. that totally get what I'm talking about. <laughs> At this point, they're nodding their heads. And so, you know, you talk smack in one place, but you come back and you're like, hey, they're the client, I'll just do what you want. But we know better. If I asked the dentist, hey, could you screw that implant into my mouth with plastic? He'd look at me like, you're just ridiculous. And yet a customer will ask me to do something, and if I say, okay, well, you're the client, I look ridiculous. If you don't want to lose profits, and you're seeding your professionality, the first thing you have to do is realize that you're giving that up. That's a choice you're making. One of the questions I ask clients often when we get started is I'll say, okay, this website, I just want to understand the thing that we're going to build together here, and we're going to collaborate on this, but this website, is it for you? And I say, well, of course it is for me. Okay, so you're going to set it up to be the default when you open your browser, and you're going to be the only one looking at it. You're just, you know, every time you open a browser, you look at your site, you're like, I love it. <laughs> that, is it for you? Well, no, it's for my customers. Okay. I just want to get clear on that because at some point in this project, you're going to show up and tell me what you like in terms of the colors and the stuff you're doing, and you're going to want to do that as if we were doing this just for you. But it's not for you, right? We want to get clear on it. It's for your customers. Well, of course. And see, when you do it up front, we don't have to have a big emotional debate because no one's invested yet. But when you do it up front, and you manage expectations and you define roles, you don't have to cede any of your professionality. Does that make sense? Yeah? Awesome. Well, today, what I'm talking about are basically two sides of the same coin. Two sides of the same coin. And the first side of the coin that we're talking about, this is all about lost profits, but in reality, it's just the same coin on both sides, not being professional enough or being too professional. When you're not professional enough, you forget to ask the question, how are we gonna define success? You go straight to the solution. A customer walks in and says, I need a website. You don't ask, are you sure you need a website? Maybe you only need a landing page. Maybe you only need a one page site. You don't ask the question because you're in worker mode, okay? They can, because you love solving problems. This isn't bad, this is a wonderful thing. You love solving problems. The problem is this, you step into an organization, you step into an interaction with the customer, and more often than not, all of us do the same thing. We jump right into the solution. We jump right into the moment where we're thinking, yes, I think I could solve that, I think I could solve that, I know how to solve that. Instead of marinating ourselves in the problem space, we jump right into the solution space before saying, walk me through this. Are we sure we need to do what you're suggesting is the solution? Let's go back and sit down and talk about the problem. And the more we spend time in the problem, the deeper we understand the problem. And that's when we ask, what success criteria look like for you? Success criteria may be a certain amount of revenue that it hits. It may be a certain number of paid visits that come. It may be something completely different, like, you know, my, co my company just differentiates itself in the marketplace. And that may be just, it may be easy, right? I worked with one financial services firm where they, the only goal was to differentiate themselves because no one could remember them. And their website was green. And every one of their competitors' website was green. It was not technically difficult to make a website that was gray and blue. It was not technically different. And yet, just changing the color palette distinguished them from all their peers. We get so excited about solving deep technical problems, we forget to ask what is the success? How are we going to define success here? And when we forget that, we seed our professionality. Your job isn't to do what you want. Your job isn't to do what your client wants. Your job isn't even to do what your client's clients want. Your job is to do what your client's clients need. Let me repeat that one more time. Your job is to do what your clients, clients need. Does that make sense? That's when you have the success. 
depending on however they define the criteria, when you understand the objectives of your client and how they're going to interact with their clients, if you understand those needs, you can then deliver on that value proposition. That's the one side of the coin. I call that being the doormat. When we're talking about lost profits. When you see your professionality, you're the doormat. You're the person who backs up and just says, I'll just, I'll be a worker bee. I'll just do whatever it is that you want me to do. And the reality is you're better than that. You're smarter than that. You're worth more than that. And so by all means, it, it's important, it's critical for you to step into that role and be the professional. But there's a challenge. Because we often overshoot and head towards the perfectionist, don't we? How many of you started and you were not classically trained in whatever it is you're doing right now? That's right. So you remember how it got started, right? You worked on a website for your cousin, your brother, your sister, your mother-in-law, your neighbor, someone that your mom told somewhere else in the supermarket that you could do, and so all of a sudden you're there and you build out a little site and you don't know exactly what you're doing, but you try it and you don't charge much for it or maybe you do it for free and someone tells you, hey, you can do my site for free too if you put it on your own portfolio and that at that moment kind of wins you know, the, the day and so you think, well, awesome, I'm gonna have three sites on my portfolio. And so you go and you do that and you work hard and you build a site or two. And then you start getting a little smarter, a little better. You start using some frameworks, you start using some additional tools, you start posting on better sites, and you, you start building everything up, and you get better until you start getting excited about the work you do. How many of you are in that place where you're excited by the work you do? That's good. I feel bad for the other half of you. We'll have to talk afterwards. So you get to that point where you're excited, but here's what happens. Often we get so excited that we now overshoot whatever the customer needs because now it's really about our needs. We need the puzzle. We need to solve it. We need to work with that. Oh, there's a new plugin. I want to try that. Oh, there's a new theme framework. I want to learn that. And we start trying to learn on our client's time. And you're not professional when you do that. Clients pay for results. They're not paying for you to learn. And we get so enticed by the puzzle that we want to solve that sometimes we overshoot the problem we actually need to solve. I was working on a website for a local church, friends of mine, and, and we built this site out, and the logo had both greens and blue hues as part of that logo, and so I spent days, a, a literal week, getting the color palette perfect. Every color and nuance of that color, and the gradients and the shades and the tints, and even the green accent color was in there, and it was perfect. And I got the site all done. It was an entire week of just color palette work. And then I invited the pastor over, and I said, I was thrilled. I mean, I had solved this puzzle. And I was thrilled. I said, hey, can you come over and take a look at the site? And so he came over, and he looked. He's like, that's nice. You know how people say that's nice when you, you know that they're, they're not saying anything important to you, right? He's like, that's nice. And then he says things that you've never heard. He said, do you mind if I have my wife look at it? <laughs> Why? Why do you need your wife to validate the work that I've spent all this time doing? He said, because well, I'm colorblind. <laughs> I know you've never spent a week on a color palette for a client who's colorblind. That's just me. <clears throat> but trust me when I tell you that you do similar things. We overshoot by far by doing things that get us excited, by doing things that entice us, by solving the puzzles and problems that we think we need to get perfect. And by the time we finally get it timed and tuned and perfect and we show it to the client, we realize they're looking at us with a, that's, that's nice. And they don't realize how much work we've put into it. And while we have overshot that process, we've also burned all sorts of profit. You see how you can lose profit on either end of it? You lose profit when you're not in charge of the professional dynamics and relationship. You lose profit because you do iteration 12 and 13 and 14, just trying to make the client happy or at least go away. The gal who I, I built that site for, the massage site, it got done, it got launched, 
And then she started calling for help. She needed a little touch up here, a little help there. Got, got it done, and then she moved. We were in California, which is on the West Coast, and she moved to Florida, which is on the other side of the country. And she said, well, but I can still have you help me with my site. And I said, actually, you can't. Technically, I can't work on projects outside of California. <laughs> That's a total lie. <laughs> I don't recommend that you lie to customers, but I was like, just please, someone else deal with her. Right? Because I had lost profit before I got the $200, much less all the monthly support that she thought came with her $200. We can sit on the side of not being professional enough, but we can also just as equally sit on the side of being too professional. And work and work and work and completely do away with all our profit. So my challenge to you this afternoon is really, really simple. When you step into an interaction with a customer, when you step into that first set of conversations with a customer, do not rush towards the solution side. Spend more than enough time, spend twice as much time as you think you need on the pain points, on the problem side. Marinate in that problem space until you fully comprehend all of what's going on it will allow you to speak more intelligently and more effectively into that problem space. And you'll be able to design a better solution because of it. You'll also be able to charge more because of it. Because you'll be able to connect the value you're bringing to the actual pain that's involved. That's the first part of it, marinate in the problem space. The second is make sure you're clear on your rules. Make sure you're the professional in the room when it comes to doing the work you do. And make sure that's very clear. And the third is, as much as you're being a professional, watch for overshoot. Watch your own tendencies and proclivities, your desire to make things so perfect and so right that you've gone above and beyond. I know we love to talk about exceeding every expectation. There's exceeding expectations by a little bit, and then there's just, what the heck happened to that guy over there? Don't, don't go there. You can exceed expectations by a little bit. But watch yourself. Your tendencies to overshoot will completely destroy your ability to generate revenue for yourself. And you'll look back, and all you'll have are funny stories that you can tell other people years later that only now kind of make me laugh kind of make me cry. And that's all I have to say to you. So thank you very much. My name is Chris Lama. I blog over at chrislama.com. You can find me also at, at Chris Lama on Twitter. And, uh, and I think we're going to open it up for any questions if there are any. I shall facilitate the questions. Does anybody have any questions? Here's a mark. Hey Chris. Um, so just a quick one. So going through that sort of journey of being really unprofessional and then becoming either professional or too professional or whatnot, um, you know, have you seen like a timeline that this tends to happen in or does it seem to be, you know, is it like a a predictable kind of a three-year thing or a five-year thing or is it not really something you can predict? Uh, unfortunately, I think that's related to IQ. <laughs> <laughs> some people actually are have a tendency to learn faster than others and some people learn from their mistakes faster than others and others are still giving away websites to whoever their mom talks to at the supermarket. So I, what I tell people is I can lead a horse to water but I can't make them smart. <laughs> Cool. Any more questions? Okay. I'm coming. Hi Chris, nice to meet you. First. Uh, just a quick question. Bearing all this in mind, how often have you actually fired clients because it's going to affect your value proposition? Um, if you do a search on Google for people who say no a lot, right? People who say no a lot, I rank number one. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, like, I'm not joking, you could go search for it. 
Um, I say no all the time. I don't say no like a jerk, but um, I, you know, I, I have no interest in participating in something that's not going to be mutually beneficial for both me and my customer. Yeah. Hi, Chris. Um, do you find any methodology, in, and if so, what the methodology would you follow in developing or engaging with customers? Um, so, it's a it's a variation that I have built now over 20 years that's related to kind of what, what we now call agile. Um, success of experimentation, uh, but at the core of it, what I find is that most customers don't actually know what they want up front. Um, so almost every project I work on is actually a two-phase project, where the first phase is literally just doing research and working with them to find out what the real problems are, and only then can we actually describe what the solution is going to be and how much it's going to cost. Um, and that works a lot better. Uh, there's a bunch more that's related to, to success of experimentation in that process, but probably longer than we have right here. I write about it over at christhomas.com, along with lots of other stuff. I think, oh, yeah. So how do you recap the cost all this time up I, I can't hear you, but there's a microphone coming to you right there. So how do you recap the cost when you're spending all this time up front and then... Um... No, I, I, don't, I don't do that upfront work for free. So people pay to investigate. So, I, so on, a, on a recent project that was about a $50,000 deal, we probably spent five to $6,000 just trying to figure out what the problem was. Um, the benefit of doing this approach is that at the end of that first phase, we know two things. First, we know what the core of the problem is. But second, we know whether or not we want to work together. And sometimes uh, that report that comes at the end of that first phase is good enough to give to them so they can go shop for another person because I'm bowing out, right? You, you interact with a person, you realize, there's not enough money in the world to make me work with you anymore, so move on. Yeah. Uh, firstly, just thank you, man. You're awesome. Um, secondly, you can totally just Google people who say no, like, you're not one, dude. I'm not lying. I say no all the time. Any more questions? Yeah, yeah. Any more questions for Chris? Now's your chance. All right, thank you very much.